I get the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. His name is John Seely Brown, uh, known affectionately as the JSB. He's the former uh, chief scientist for Xerox Corporation and director of the uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, the Park Center. You will know uh, lots of great technologies emanated uh, from that, including uh, the present day operating system for the Apple computer. He explores the white space between disciplines and builds bridges between desperate organizations and ideas. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts, the National Academy of Education, the fellow, he's a fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence. He serves on numerous boards, and public and private, including Amazon, and has been a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation in Incutel. He received his BA from Brown University in uh, mathematics and, a phys and, and, and physics and a PhD from the University of Michigan in computer and communication sciences. Uh, he was a former member of our faculty here in information and computer sciences. And so that means that we're, we're particularly affectionate uh, for what he has to say today. I will tell you up front that uh, he's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and he promises to deliver a rousing presentation. So without any further ado, the JSB. And with that, I think I'll just sit down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for such a kind uh, introduction. Um, I think it's safe to assume all of us in this room appreciate the fact that we are, in fact, living in amazing times. Ingenuity reigns supreme, as we will see throughout today and afterwards, um, and we're here to honor some of that kind of incredible ingenuity. Um, the past, last 18th, 19th, and 20th century, could be characterized by the S curve, the logistic curve, depending on what school you came from, could be characterized by the notion of the era of stability. Skills lasted, hmm, a lifetime. Career paths, you kind of had a pretty good idea what was up. And then something happened. We call it the big shift. 21st century infrastructure, exponential continual expansion of computational capabilities. And we all are kind of sick and tired of hearing about the exponential, but it is here. Um, more realistically, this exponential curve really is characterized by 18 month punctuated evolutions, bang, 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 bang. Uh, just when you've got something you figured out, bang, has already changed again. Believe me, working with the Amazon uh, AWS cloud, I can guarantee you that happens almost every day for me. Uh, this is kind of very interesting. What it really does mean is yesterday's best practices are rapidly, rapidly becoming outmoded and perhaps more critical here. Even maybe our ways of knowing, our various ways of knowing maybe are becoming outmoded with what we have, the tools we have for today. I love to look at this quote by Kevin Kelly, the cycle of obsolescence accelerating. The average lifetime of his phone app is a mere 30 days. You won't have time to master anything before it is <laughs> displaced. Curiously, this actually is something subtle because it means every one of us will always be a newbie. Let me tell you, that is something that most of us are not familiar with. The cat, no matter, six months from now, I'm going to feel like a newbie all over again. That actually has a lot to do with maybe instilling a sense of humility in us, given that fact. Yes, unquestionably, the game really has changed. I like to look at it this way. The industrial age, and so on. When I grew up, my father took me aside and said, John, think about the industrial age as a steamboat. You set a course, you had grit, and you just plowed through anything in front of you. Um, I said, you know, Dad, get serious. Uh, I'm going to become a sailor. 
Uh, I'm going to learn how to play with the winds, uh, kind of use those naturally occurring forces. And if I get blown off, of course, I will attack. Um, and I came to Silicon Valley, and I learned that tacking was called pivoting. Uh, <laughs> so I felt right at home when I first came out here. And then lo and behold, about five years later, I realized, oh my god, nope, the game has changed yet again. This is like whitewater kayaking, a term that I got from my colleague Ann Pendleton Julian here. Um, there's something very special about this. No longer are we in an era that's just about deepening individual expertise within our silos. Think about that a moment. That is a serious challenge to most of us because most universities are built around silos. Most of our industries are built around silos. That game no longer works. Instead, I think it's really a question of now, how do we participate in and shape knowledge flows happening all around us? All kinds of flows. This means much of this flows have to do with tacit as well as explicit. How do you actually survive in those flows? How do you actually work with those flows? How do you maintain a balance? How do you get embedded in that flow and work with those flows? has a lot to do with what does it mean to be really at home and productive in this beginning of the next, I think, 80 years. And to me, that has a lot of the feeling of being a whitewater kayaker. And those of you who do whitewater kayaking, you know you have to kind of understand your own center of gravity. You have to understand who the hell you are. You have to understand your forces that you can do. Because when you flip in a kayak, you really want to know what can you do. Um, that's not the time to start thinking. That's the time to start having instincts that really build on who you are. Um, also, if you're a kayaker, you realize that if for this white water world, one of the most important sets of skills is how do you actually read context? Most of us in this room have grown up worshiping content. Maybe we're shifting to a world that reading context is now is at least as important as reading content. How do you look at the context? How do you look at the disturbances on the surface structure and understand something about the deep structure? How do you interpret those flows? Well, what lies beneath those little ripples? And in particular, how do you really think about leveraging the currents, the disturbances, and these flows for amplified action? And you're going to see amplified action um, as we look at these fantastic exhibits around us. But you know, reading context isn't that simple. It really hit me being in London the day that Brexit happened. Um, it's clear that our ability to read context is seriously impaired. Almost every week we wake up and realize we're not really reading these contexts very well. We were awfully surprised by Brexit. We were surprised by many other things that are happening. How do you actually interrogate context? And, by the way, equally important is not just how do you kind of interrogate and work with context, but how do you work with each other? How do you actually collaborate at a distance? How do you look at now, how do you work in teams all over the place? And I think it's a tremendous honor for me and for many of us here to be saying this in front of you guys, Judy and Gary, because um, I think you pioneered the way for many of us to understand how to work in a fundamentally new way. And when you did that, it wasn't all that obvious that you weren't a bit crazy. <laughs> uh, I knew these high grade college kids, but these folks a long time ago. <laughs> um, you were right. Um, but I'll tell you something. We also need new ways to move from mechanistic thinking to understanding contexts again, problems that evolve sets of exchanges with complex feedback loops. How do we start thinking in terms of context, in terms of the dynamic attractors, network affordances, and contextual propensities? These are things we don't think much about, or we call them epiphenomenal, or kind of externalities, and our beautiful linear models, we kind of make believe they don't exist. We can't do that anymore. We're in a new world where these types of kind of new style of thinking in terms of these dynamic affordances become so critical in terms of the feedback structures. Perhaps, 
perhaps this whitewater world may require something new, a new sense, a seventh sense. From Josh Cooper Ramo, the seventh sense is the ability to look at an object and see or imagine, I'll come back to this, the way in which it is changed by connection. Whether you are commanding an army, running a Fortune 500 company, planning a great work of art, or thinking about your own child's education, there's something new in terms of these connections. What is this seventh sense that you need to understand what this hyper-connected world actually means? Yes, we need to see the way that things, everything perhaps, and something is changed by hyper-connectivity. And for this, I want to suggest there is a new game. It's a game that we actually need imagination. We all hear a lot about creativity. Maybe we need to refocus a little bit more on imagination. How do we begin to see things, imagine things in brand new ways? Imagination is more important than knowledge. Albert Einstein. Imagination has not become great until human beings given the courage and the strength to use it to create. Montessori. In fact, I think that idea of courage mattering is something we have to continue to bring to the surface. Um, this hits me in two ways. Personally speaking, uh, this is actually a very interesting memo that I dug up uh, in uh, 1974. I'd just gone to Xerox Park. Um, and this is a beautiful memo written by two brilliant physicists explaining to a couple of computer scientists how ridiculous an idea it was to ever think about anything as stupid as the Ethernet. <laughs> and they went on to prove mathematically why that could never work or was one of the dumbest ideas and we should never allow this project to go forward. Uh, <clears throat> this is a real memo. This really did happen. Um, and in fact, I think it's kind of curious to now see that how in this world do you do things that are equally crazy and how do you have the courage to believe in your imagination for things that right off the bat mathematically seem incoherent or crazy as I could almost try to convince you that this idea was in 1974 um, and of course it turned out to be unbelievably brilliant. Um, in this also context I want to argue that serendipity matters given your interest in human computer interfaces and uh, interactions here. Another tiny example from my own background at Xerox Park hit me. Inspiration, in terms of serendipity, something I think we have to amplify more and think more and more about in this kind of white water world, can come from anywhere in a split second. Let me show you the example that blew my mind. Here is an actual event. This is an Escher button, but this side was on Ramana Rao's wall, and John Lamping, more mathematically inclined than some of us, walked in, because we were trying to figure out how to map an infinite space into a finite area, um, and said, oh, you know, you see art. I see a conformal mapping of a hyperbolic half plane onto a unit circle. I said, you know, that's right. It's not the first thing I would have thought of. <laughs> not at all. And lo and behold, matter of a few days later, this was the birth of the hyperbolic browser. This completely transformed how we began to interact with infinite trees and how to work with them uh, in this new dynamic mode of understanding how to computationally embed this conformal mapping to actually move in this unit um, um, circle. Um, this was 1995. Again, a little bit about the courage it takes. I would say it's about 2015 <laughs> that this has now become popular. About 2010, it started to catch on. These ideas take a while, um, but there is something that says, you know, these things can happen in a split moment if you're willing to kind of look at them and say, can I use this idea in a completely unexpected way? This was nothing that Escher had in mind, I will guarantee you. <laughs> so let's step back and say, what is the big picture here? And I think to me, there is a major issue we face today. I'm going to call it the crisis of imagination. 
In a world of exponential change where complexity reigns supreme, imagination cannot just be an add-on. It is not just relevant in the domain of the arts, narrowly or broadly construed. We need, again, we need to find ways to enable the arts, humanities, sciences to fuse together, creating a new kind of an alloy. I think this says something much more than this is just a cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, anti-disciplinary move. Think about how an alloy gets created. What is the fusion that takes place? I think the challenge we have as innovators and as educators in this kind of whitewater world, how do you actually build a new kind of an alloy that really takes seriously the kind of fusion, not just casual mixing of these? I think that, to me, is a fundamental challenge. And I like to kind of think of it as perhaps in this whitewater world now, with imagination, crisis of imagination before us, perhaps we should start reimagining Leonardo da Vinci for the 21st century. Look what he did. How did he fuse so many of these things together? How now are we going to go forth and to do the same? I think one could say that the unique power of the human imagination comes in part from its ability to integrate opposing qualities like emotion and reason, curiosity and certainty. And we can go on and on and on and add to that. Um, can we actually include in this almost a new kind of, you might call it a blended ontology, a new way of being, not just a new way of knowing, a very new way of being, kind of how do we cultivate a blended ontology with human and machine interfaces? Now, I want to look at this in terms of the most obvious, in terms of almost an epistemological, before I map it into the ontological shift. We all know about homo sapien, knowledge. We know about homo faber, man is maker, man is knowledge. We tend to underplay, although I think we're going to have to up it up, amp it up a bit, homo lutens, understanding how do you play with systems. It could be games we heard about today. It also could be, you know, how do you actually play with a system? What's the freedom of movement, uh, like in a steering wheel, and so on and so forth? I won't bore you all that, but it could be. Now add, how do we augment each of those with augmented intelligence is meant to augment that component of how are we a homo sapien, that component of how are we a homo faber, and that component of homo ludens. Those are all quite different games. The interactions are completely different. And the question is, does that create a new sense of being at the same time creating a new sense of a networked imagination that comes from the ability to really fuse homo sapien, homo faber, and homo ludens with the network age? With that, thank you.